Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, VSA Online. Uh, to, today, we have a talk by uh, Madison Cotteret, and uh, I will introduce him uh, shortly. Um, before that, I want to make a short announcement about on, uh, ongoing or uh, ongoing preparations uh, for the midnight VSA event in June, uh, which I plan to hold in Lulio. So I posted to the chat, so please check uh, the chat for the uh, link to the website uh, with the actual information. Uh, so. Uh, so you can see the uh, venue and uh, the updated uh, re uh, registration uh, prices. So please notice two alternatives. So you can either book accommodation on the site, on the conference site. So here are the uh, negotiated prices, or uh, you can uh, select accommodation in the city and uh, there will be organized uh, a bus transfer to the, uh, to the workshop venue and back. Uh, so please uh, check uh, check the website. Uh, the registration uh, the pre registration page is open, but the uh, registration page will be online within, uh, as I expect, uh, within one week. Uh, so, but I will announce this uh, separately. So now I stop sharing the screen. And I would like to announce the today's talk by Madison Cotteret from Technical University of <coughs> Ilmenau in Germany. So, Madison, the floor is yours, please. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Uh, right, we did check the tech. Let's give it a go. Um, do you see my first slide in full screen? Yes. Beautiful. Um, right, so hello everyone, I'm Madison, I'm doing a, a joint PhD between uh, the University of Groningen in the Netherlands and also the uh, Technical University uh, University Ilmenau in Germany. Uh, I'm going to be talking about vector symbolic finite state machines in attractive neural networks. So before I get going and to actually start uh, driving through the slides, I just want to give a very brief high level overview of uh, what we try to do here. So we wanted to take a classical attractor model, so the Hotfield attractor network, and then make as few changes to it as possible, and in particular, as few biologically unrealistic or expensive changes to it as possible, such that uh, the, these Hotfield-like attractor networks could emulate uh, any arbitrary finite state machine, where the states within our finite state machine are now represented by uh, attractor states in our attractor network, and by giving um, stimuli to the attractor network, you can trigger your network state to jump between the uh, correct attractor states. So that's the overall idea. Um, so we start off with, I think, the not too bold assertion that biological units are very noisy. So neurons are noisy, synapses are noisy. Yet, despite being composed of very unreliable noisy units, the brain still seems to function robustly. Um, now, one architecture that we have, which is able to circumvent this um, noisiness and get robust, again, get robust computational performance, uh, are attractor networks, where your neurodynamics can be simplified to a <clears throat> to descending on some energy plane. And then, we, what we know is that many cognitive processes can be modelled as an itinerancy between these attractor states. Um, but my claim is that we don't have any easy, in, inexpensive way yet that you can go from a uh, hot field attractor network and give it these kind of state transition functionalities. So that's one half of the reasoning of, of, as to uh, why we did what I'm, about, what I'm about to present. The other half is that as a lab, we quite like to make uh, asynchronous neuromorphic chips. And of course, those are made out of no, uh, noisy devices. So I said novel devices are noisy. So I'm kind of referencing, um, well, if we're using memristors, for example, then they will always then they will always have a certain degree of process variations, and your conductances will never be exactly I don't know one and zero. Um, and indeed, when we're making an analog sinuses neurons, 
they will also always incur a certain degree of noise. And so one way we can get, we can get around this is simply take a leaf out of the bio biologies book, use attractor dynamics. And this has indeed been, been done already. But then the idea is that if we can trick a hot field network to also have this, uh, these, these state transition functionalities, then we can build uh, attractor-based, well, very robust attractor-based state machines using very noisy devices. And that would be quite cool. So I'm going to start off by uh, discussing, a, giving a very brief introduction to uh, hot field attractor networks. So a hot field attractor network is an all connected uh, binary, well, all connected network of neurons where the neurons are binary, or I guess I should say uh, bipolar, so they can be either in a plus one or a minus one state. And there are quite a lot of them, N. Um, and then they have a, either asynchronous or synchronous update rule, whereby uh, the neurons project back to themselves recurrently by, via your weights matrix uh, W. And then maybe there's also some external input to your network given here by uh, H input. And then the neurons have a, uh, an element-wise sign function as their uh, activation function. Uh, what this means is any neuron which receives um, zero, yes, zero greater? zero greater where any neuron that receives zero or positive input there is then goes to a plus one state and any neuron that receives negative input goes to a minus one state and what we know is that the neurodynamics can simply be simplified to descending an energy function which is given by this expression so a, uh, a quadratic product of your uh, network state and your weight matrix but then the question is then how do you construct your weight such that this um, descending of the energy function results in some useful computation? Uh, and so we know that if we have some set of uncorrelated, hyper, uncorrelated hypervectors, we're going to call them hypervectors now, we're saying n is very large. Um, so some set of uncorrelated hypervectors to x nu. And if you construct your weights matrix to be a sum of outer products of these hypervectors, then your energy function will look like this. So it's a, uh, a sum over squares of inner products between your network state and your hypervectors, um, which basically means that around every uh, state that you stored in your network, uh, so ev around every x nu, there will now be a parabolic energy well. Um, and this means that if we, if we turn to the diagram over here, that if, for example, you stored uh, the minus one plus one state as an attractor within your network, but Imagine actually it's not minus one plus one, it's minus one plus one, but loads longer. That if you if you were to initialize your network in some state that's near to this state, but not at the very bottom of the energy well, then simply by this, but sorry, near to the state insofar as it has some significant overlap with it, then simply by the uh, neural dynamics, it will descend to the bottom of the energy well and arrive at the uh, perfect completed um, denoised, whatever, uh, pattern you stored in your network. And this is why you can refer to them as an auto-associative memory, but also why we say they have uh, pattern completion properties. So I took these figures from online, but the idea is that someone has a hot field network where they've stored three attractors within their network. So we've got one attractor corresponding to a bike, another some people, and another some M&Ms. Um, and we see that whenever the images flash into noise, that's the network being uh, initialized in some noisy state, which is corrupted, but still measurably near to one of the attractor states. And so you see over time, it will denoise itself by descending to the bottom of an energy well and arriving at the perfect stored pattern. And that's what we see. Now, my kind of, sketchy claim here is that you could, if you squinted really hard, uh, describe describe the Hopford network here as a very rudimentary state machine. So we have uh, three states, one corresponding to uh, the bike attractor, another one for the people attractor, and another for the M&Ms attractor. And so we know that, or we can kind of pretend that as a state machine, if we were in the bike state, for example, and we were to give a very strong input that corresponds to the people state, 
then our network would jump from the bike attractor to the people attractor state. And similarly, we could then apply the apply a lot of the uh, an input corresponding to the bike state, and maybe we'll jump back to the bike attractor. But if we now really start to consider the state machine that we've um, implemented here, or that we are describing our network as, we'll see it's incredibly simplistic. And um, to be more precise, what I mean by simplistic is that we don't have any uh, state-dependent transitions. And so what this means is that the state to which you travel, so your target state for any input, is entirely independent of the state that you started in. Isn't it? It's dependent only upon the input you gave. So if you give a very strong input for the state uh, people, you will always transition to the people state, regardless of where you started. And conversely, if you give the input bike, you'll always go to the bike state. What we would instead like is if we could um, adapt the hot food network so that we can store any general finite state machine and indeed one that has um, uh, these so-called state dependent transitions. So you can see here as kind of a very clear example of this. Um, if we have these six states, oh, I've got to introduce this. It's a graph of root gods because it has a, it's, it's an interesting graph um, or state machine rather. Um, if we were to start off in the uh, attractor state, the attractor state corresponding to Zeus, and we were to give some, in, some stimulus corresponding to father is, we want our network to jump to the state Kronos. However, if we're already in the state Kronos and we give the input father is, we want it to jump to the state Uranus. And this would be, I guess, this, this is a almost pure example of the state-dependent switching that we want to embed within our Hopfield network. And now I will describe how we do it. So after some water. So the first thing we do, did is to introduce some new terms into the weights matrix. So on the left, we have our normal set of terms that are in all attractor networks, so your sum of outer products of states as before. But now we also have um, these edge terms. So we've added a new edge matrix for every transition that we want to implement within our uh, finite state machine. And these edge terms are given by this. So every edge has uh, an associated uh, target hypervector. So, so we'll target attractor state. So some state that you want to transition to as a result of this edge, you have a source state that you want to start off at and some stimulus here on the right that ought to uh, trigger the transition. Um, and then we need to be, uh, oh, and, and then just, ju just for clarity's sake, um, of course, I've been a bit sloppy with the notation here. These target, these target and source uh, attractor states they also exist within the attractor summation. So these really are attractor states that exist within the Hopford network. Um, yes, and then the final alteration that we make to the Hopfield network's functioning in order to um, implement the transitions is how we model uh, input to the network. So we modeled input to the network as an effective masking operation. So we say um, for some bipolar hypervector S input, so plus or minus one, um, so uh, a, a length N vector consisting of plus or minus ones, the behavior we want is that um, only neurons or dimensions where S is plus one are allowed to partake in the dynamics. All of the neurons where S is minus one, we want to set to zero. And so the way we achieve this, or, or I guess the way we write it down really, is that we apply a, an element-wise heavy side function to our bipolar vector S. So this converts it from plus or minus one to zero and one. And then we perform a Hadamard multiplication between our network state Z and this resulting binary vector. But uh, I, need to be, I want to be clear here that what we're implementing here is not really a, it's not a Hadamard binding operation because um, well, for reasons I'll give in a sec, it's, it's, it's a masking operation. So we're setting um, approximately half of the neurons within our network to zero. We're, we're, we're not, letting them partake within, not letting them partake in the dynamics. And the reason we do this is that eventually we want this maths or this, um, the system this describes to be, implement, to be implementable in, uh, in an asynchronous system. And 
if you think about it for a bit, you you imagine that actually, if you have an attractor network that's trying to uh, converge on different attractor states, then if you are asynchronously flipping bits in order to try and and in order to try and execute a, a Hadamard binding operation, then it simply wouldn't work. Um, so yes, input as a masking operation, not as a binding operation. So then, in order to so then in order to figure out how this affects the dynamics, we need to consider what the postsynaptic sum will be in the different scenarios. So if we consider first the simplest case that our network state at some time t is in, is in some attractor state x mu, we then need to work out in order to figure out what the dynamics will be, what our postsynaptic sum uh, w times z will be, because um, of course this will determine what our next state will be. So we have uh, the first term is just the, the, the normal hot field term, I guess. So you have your sum of outer products of states, and uh, this we, and, and then from this summation, the only term that will pop out will be the one where nu equals mu, because every every other term will be uh, zero if we're scale if we're scaling and taking an infinite limit. But then the question is then what what will the interaction be between our state x mu and our edge terms? So, although there may be some edge term for which the starting state in that transition x source is the same as our x mu here, because within our because within our um, within this edge term we've bound it with some stimulus, this will overall give zero inner product with any of our network states with with any of our attractor states because it's been bound with the stimulus. We haven't unbound it at all, and so we get this. We get this. And so our network state um, on the next time step is going to be a sign of our postsynaptic sum, which we've just shown is approximately a sign of the state we're currently in. And so we're going to stay, we're going to stay in the state we're currently in. And these, this is just to say, we still have our attractor dynamics. We haven't accidentally broken them by inserting these edge terms. But then the more important case is to wonder what happens when we are in some attractor state, which we're going to denote x source, so implying that there is some transition which uses this as its source state, and imagine, and then consider what happens when we're applying as input some uh, vector s, so some stimulus vector s um, as a masking vector to our network. So that involves now working out what this quantity is, because that will determine what our next network state will be. Um, so Due to the fact that I will run out of screen space if I have to write Hadamard H S everywhere, I am instead of uh, I'm instead going to write it out as just a big S. But please remember this Z T Hadamard product by the uh, big S. It is not a Hadamard binding operation; it's a masking operation because the big S here is uh, binary plus or minus one. So again, we need to consider what our postsynaptic sum is. The first set of terms just it just gives out the attractor we're already in, maybe with a factor of a half, maybe with a factor of n. We're just uh, get, getting rid of proportionality um, constants. But now we need to, but now we need to wonder what, how, what the interaction is between our uh, edge terms and uh, our input network status. And so if we use our imagination a bit, we'll see that the only term in this summation that will be non-zero or non-negligible, I guess, will be the one where the X source state is the, so the X source state in the transition is the same as the state we're currently in. And the stimulus in the transition is the same as the stimulus that we're using as a mask vector. So in that case, um, the, some, uh, one set of terms pops out, they cancel, and you end up with your target state popping out. And of course, what this means is that um, your network state, your, the network state of your next time step is the sign of your postsynaptic sum, which we've just said is approximately the target state. And so we do indeed uh, jump to the target state on the next time step. Um, yes, so this is how we implement uh, transitions within the hot field like attractor model. And this is it working. So we see here that uh, we start off in some attractor state Hades, and we give to the network the input father is. This causes the network to jump to the state Kronos, 
uh, we then give the input file that is again, it jumps from Kronos to Uranus. So that's nice, that's working. We have our state dependent transitions. Um, a few other points of note, the network is uh, robust to nonsense inputs because uh, somehow in the uh, uh, Greek pantheon of gods, um, Mr. Uranus doesn't have a father. So if, you, if you're in a state Uranus and you give the input father is, nothing happens because it doesn't correspond to a valid edge. So this is just a check. Our network is robust to nonsense input. And then there are a few other things here. For example, um, you can have that repeated application of the same stimulus makes you jump between two different states. Um, this is just to show you do have quite, you do have quite general embedding. We haven't yet found a case where you can't embed something. But to really be able to say that we can embed general finite state machines, we unfortunately have to make a few kind of uh, quick hacks to make sure uh, really any state machine can be embedded. Or rather, we, we tick all the boxes of, yes, we can do state finite state machines. So the first problem um, was that if you consider that in an asynchronous system, you could never be sure that you can never be sure that you can apply stimulus for just one time step because time is where well, yeah, everything's asynchronous. You don't know how quickly your system's going to react or you can't apply stimulus for exactly one unit of time. And what this means is that if you have a, uh, a node within your state machine, so if you have a node within your finite state machine that has an incoming and an outgoing edge with the same label, then Applying that input, applying that input will cause your network to simply jump past the middle state rather than ending up in the middle state. So, if we focus, for example, up here on Hades, the Hades Kronos Uranus uh, something, um, you you might imagine that if you're in the Hades state and you apply the father is vector for a, an indeterminate amount of time, it should jump from. Hades to Kronos and immediately to Uranus, skipping the state you want to go to. So to get around this, bit of a dirty hack, um, for every edge within our network, we add an extra dummy attractor state. And we then have that every transition that we want to make is made up of um, two applications of two different stimuli. So one stimulus takes you from your source state to this dummy state, and another stimulus takes you from this dummy state to your target state. Um, but I feel like this, this is but mainly just box ticking to make sure that you, you aren't limited in state machines you can embed. Um, what's then nice, however, is that within these dummy states, you can quite easily embed um, arbitrary output tokens. So because within a finite state machine, every transition must be able to have an arbitrary output token, we also embed in these states uh, sparse ternary hypervectors such that um, uh, these outputs can be read. So yes. That's working, good. Um, the next thing, so we started this whole thing off by saying we want to take inspiration from the brain and use uh, attractor networks because they're incredibly robust. Um, and so we would hope that um, we still retain this robustness in our network. So we haven't accidentally added uh, a load of fragility and dependence on certain, on certain uh, behaviors in your neurons for your network to still function. So in order to test this, what the, well, this is the first test, I guess, we took our weights matrix, which we constructed in the way that, in a manner which I have laboriously just explained. So this is the weights matrix that's full of many values. And then you can imagine uh, if you saw 10 attractors, there'll be some weights that want to be plus 10, minus 10, five, whatever. But we took our weights matrix and we binarized every value to plus or minus one to imitate the fact that you have weights that only have one bit of synaptic precision. Um, what we then did to make life even worse is that we added a certain amount of uh, noise to each of these um, binary weight states. So you can see here, here's, here are the two weight distributions where we've taken a weight, set it to minus one or plus one, and then added a random amount of noise. It represents quite a horrific implementation uh, and we would hope any device that we try to build hardware out of wouldn't be this bad and maybe biology is better than this, one would hope. But anyways, even with this quite bad noise, we see the network still functions basically perfectly as it's, 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 it is not affected by these non-idealities that we've imposed upon the matrix, on the weight matrix. 
And indeed, we can push this even further. So we can add noise of that is five times larger than uh, the signal within our network. So we're binarizing every, every weight to uh, one or minus one and then adding a random number of magnitude five such that our weight is basically uncorrelated with the data we wanted to um, impose upon the network. Obviously, it isn't uncorrelated. That's a tiny correlation. Um, but we see even in this case, the network still continues to function, um, albeit not as well. So I guess this is an example of the graceful degradation property, which we would always like our networks to have. Yes. Then there is a second test we did. So um, since in biology, it would be quite, well, it's, it's quite biologically unrealistic that we're using a, a, a dense auto-connected recurrent weight matrix. And so we diluted our weight matrix such that only, say, the um, top 2% of weights within our weights matrix are allowed to be non-zero. Um, so we set those to plus or minus one, but then the remaining 98% of weights we set to zero to emulate the fact that, I guess it's not emulating, well, to, to force our weights matrix to be uh, extremely sparse. And what we see is even at 98% sparsity, uh, I should mention, this is all, this is all using uh, vectors of length 10,000 to give a measure of, oh, is this a bit, abstract or um, well, the numbers that mean anything I guess um, so even for 98% sparsity so 98% of our values in our weights matrix we've artificially set to zero again the network is basically functioning perfectly it's very robust this sort of non-ideality and we can push it further setting 99% of our weights to be sparse to, to be zero sorry and you have the same effect of well the network still performing the correct walk between your attractor states but um, not as well. But I think that's quite reasonable in terms of, well, we've gotten rid of 99% of our synapses. The fact that the network's suffering a bit is to be expected. Uh, and, if you push, and if you push it further, it breaks, which is again, to be expected. Then the final test to really just check that we haven't broken the attractor network by adding our weight terms and that our, uh, our transition mechanism is really compatible with the kind of attractor paradigm is to make sure that our network is functions even when you have asynchronous updates. So the way we did this is that we swapped out our synchronous update rule that we've been using up till now and um, changed it for a stochastic asynchronous variant such that on any time step, only 10% uh, of neurons within our network are allowed to update and the remaining 90% just stay in the same, stay in the same state regardless of the postsynaptic sum. And we see indeed that it continues to work. So that's good. Um, but of course, you can imagine this wouldn't work for this possibly. I shouldn't, yeah, if, if we were to try to apply our stimulus asynchronously or something, and we were applying Hadamard products rather than a masking operation, this would not work. Um, but if, and of course, in this instance, transitions take a finite amount of time rather than just finite number of time sets rather, rather than just happening in one or two. So this kind of concludes, oh, it's in water. <clears throat> this kind of concludes the work that I did on um, discrete um, uh, implementing transitions between discrete attractor states. And I kind of wrapped up last year, but I'm now gonna go over some newer stuff that I've been doing, which is um, a bit spicier, but it's very much a work in progress. And that was to generalize all the previous results and uh, I guess same mechanism, generalizing it to a continuum. So now instead of having a discrete set of attractor states that where a stimulus, a stimulus causes you to bounce between them, not bounce, but transition between them, uh, the idea is now we should hopefully, hopefully be able to generate a, uh, a continuous attractor network whereby by applying certain stimuli, your network state smoothly moves about your the manifold you've encoded or the uh, yeah, the continuous attractor manifold you've stored within your network. So of course, the first thing we need to do is come up with a way is, is to or come up, I did not come up with this, is to uh, perhaps smoothly parameterize our 
um, hyperdimensional states. So for that, we switched from having a discrete set of states to relying on Hadamard fractional power encoding. And uh, I guess I should point out, I realize I'm abusing the notation here. You have to imagine any function here is being applied element-wise. <clears throat> so uh, in, our, in the Hadamard fractional power encoding scheme, uh, a vector to represent the real number nu is given by e to the i omega nu, where your omegas are sampled, are, are, I, are iid sampled from some probability distribution p. And then what we know is that the similarity between any two uh, hypervectors with different nu's is given by quite nicely by a well-defined kernel function, uh, where our kernel function is defined by the uh, Fourier, or is, is given by the Fourier transform of the probability distribution from which we drew our omegas. And so if our omegas are drawn from a Gaussian probability distribution, then our, uh, our kernel is also Gaussian. And if our omegas are drawn from a, a uniform distribution, as we do in the next few slides, then our interaction kernel between, or our overlap kernel between our high dimensional states uh, is a sync function. <clears throat> so, we can now, well, no, yeah, I've got, no, good. Um, yes. So now we have our states that are, parameter, that are parameterized with the uh, fractional power encoding, and we now need to consider what other alterations we need to make to generalize this, um, the previous stuff's continuum. So the first thing to do is to change our, uh, um, neural, our, our neural activation function. So we t so it used to be a sine function, but now we're changing it to uh, like the complex analog, I suppose. So now um, on every time step, our neuron doesn't inherit just the sine of the input of its postsynaptic sum, um, it inherits the phase of it. So we have here uh, yeah, our postsynaptic sum on a uh, weight matrix time z, and then on every neuron, it's normalized by the magnitude by, by the complex magnitude of the postsynaptic sum. So um, your, neurons are no, your neurons are now no longer plus and minus ones, but they are a phase of vector. Then the other things to, general, to generalize to continuum. So where before we had a sum, of, a sum over outer products of attractor states, we now generalize this to an integral over outer product of attractor states. And similarly, where before we had a sum over our edge states, we now um, generalize this to a term that looks quite similar. So it's an integral over a similarish looking term. Um, as in, if you imagine the, so if you remember the edge states were, they had some X source, they had some X target and they had some stimulus. This is kind of similar. Um, then we can kind of pictorially understand what's going on. So if, for example, we wanted to store a, a 2D attractor surface, um, or, or well, a, a very simple flat 2D attractor surface, then we can imagine, then we can have our uh, hypervectors that are parameterized by two values, so P1 and P2. Um, we, so the first set of terms would store the attractor surface on which our network state is allowed to play, um, or is allowed to exist rather, and then the extra terms which were at, which were analogs for our edge terms basically now consist of adding an arbitrary vector field to our attractor surface but uh, an arbitrary vector field which is each bound to a certain stimulus such that this term can effectively be ignored until we mask our networks and sorry until we mask our network using that stimulus so using the binary version of that stimulus as exactly as we did in the uh, discrete uh, bipolar case. So we see this working here quite nicely. Hopefully it's fairly smooth on your screens. Um, maybe not, that's unfortunate. Um, but the, so we see here, we initialize the network state at like zero, zero, and then we mask the network state with the stimulus vector corresponding to uh, the vector field that moves your bump upwards and then to the left or down to the right. And we see that working quite nicely. Um, and yeah, the only other thing I haven't mentioned is this is using a sync, in a sync interaction kernel between our 
um, vectors. <clears throat> so that's cool, but um, obviously we don't like the fact that when you get to the edges, you hit a an energy barrier and um, yeah, you, you get stuck. So the next logical thing to do was to see if we could embed a sphere such that we don't have these barriers at the end, at the edges of our um, continuous attractor world, I should say. <clears throat> so in this instance, um, in order to store a sphere uh, within our network, or the, or rather um, store the surface of a sphere as our continuous attractor surface, uh, we parameterized our attractor state, sorry, we parameterized our hyperdimensional states using three values. So we have a 3D vector encoding and we've uh, integrated all the states on this, integrated all the states all the state on the sphere in order to add the spheres our attractor surface and then again we've chosen uh, some arbitrary vector fields that can be triggered by different stimuli um yes so you have one that's rotating in the phi z direction and one that rotates your state in the rotated so the phi x direction if that's such thing and see that working. Pretty animation. Hopefully you can see it. So um, it's exactly the same setup as before, really. So we are masking our network. We're masking our network state with different vectors um, sequentially, and then the networks, the network state simply uh, moves around your high dimensional, well, our low dimension, our low dimensional. Uh, continuous attractor surface that we've embedded within our network. So although we've shown here that the method uh, generalizes not only to continuum, also to curved manifold embeddings, the hope is that this would generalize to entirely arbitrary uh, curved manifold embeddings, such that if some psychologist decides actually um, human cognition can be modeled by uh, dynamics on the surface of a 4D Klein bottle, then we should also be able to embed this, be able to embed that within the network. Um, and indeed, any arbitrary vector field on the surface of that network, on the, on the surface of the, the climb bottle for some reason. But one big problem which I'm having with this at the moment, which um, if anyone has any ideas of how to solve, I'd be very grateful, is the fact that you run out of uh, memory within your attractor network very quickly. Um, and that's because in order to store, store this sphere of states, not sphere, is it a ball, shell? In order to store all these states, you can imagine there's quite a lot of dis distinct attractor states that we're storing within our network. And so before long, you store too many uh, different states as attractors within your network and you hit the attractor memory capacity limit and you suffer the memory blackout uh, problem, your attractor dynamics break. And of course, the normal trick to get around this is to make your hypervectors sparse. But that's a bit difficult here because we have uh, a continuous hypervector encoding uh, because we're using the Hadamard, um, the Hadamard fraction power encoding. So I'm not entirely sure about how we could keep these vectors both continuously varying and sparse such that we can um, really start to massively increase the size of the manifolds we can embed and the complexity of them, for example. So yes, any help with that, greatly appreciated. But then my conclusions. So perhaps I'm being a bit general here, but it's hopefully this presentation has been somewhat convincing um, towards the point that VSAs are very useful for achieving uh, robust computations in dynamical systems where your units or your atoms of computation, that's, that's the wrong word. Yeah, when your dynamical system is composed out of incredibly unreliable components, whether that be uh, these obviously very fake sims that we, not fake, mm, very unrealistic simulations that we have here, but with a lot of mismatch imposed, or perhaps biology, um, biological and neural sciences, or a, uh, an asynchronous analog system, or maybe even an asynchronous digital system. Um, it's yeah, very useful for getting robust computation out despite these unreliabilities. Uh, but more specifically, I've shown that um, you should be able to emulate any emulate and embed any arbitrary finite state machine into a large enough hot field-like hot field attractor network. 
um, showing it generalizes to continue continual attractor networks, um, uh, to continuous attractor networks rather, such that you can have um, flexible path integration networks. Because of course, you can imagine when I was saying that the vector fields you can embed are arbitrary, you could probably do quite a lot in terms of um, if you get creative with the vector field that uh, your stimuli trigger, there's something you can do there. But I, I currently lack the imagination to do so. Um, and hopefully it generalizes to entirely, to, to entirely general um, curve manifolds, but I am still working on that. So yes, thank you very much for your attention. I would love at least one question. Here's my email if you would like to contact me. The end. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Madison. So now, do we have any questions? So let us. I have a question. Yes. Hello. Hi. Nice talk. Um, thank you. Um, so I, I don't know if Nicole Dumont gave a talk to VSA Online a few months back, but um, but uh, you. Um, she has a way of sort of taking the velocity vector and there's like a differential equation that you can update yeah. the hypervector with. Yes, I, I need to do a, I guess, a, a deeper comparison with that method, but it seems to be more based on the use of, um, I, I think it was more, was it velocity controlled oscillators? Was it along those lines? Um, which, is, which is what the uh, like Fourier holographic reduced representations essentially are. Mm -hmm. um, so, but here's my question, um, like in that method, you can run it, but there's, there's like defacing, um, like there's, there's error, like drift error, right? So after yes. a while, it kind of breaks down, but yours is a hop field network. So does it not drift away when you're doing path integration? I expect there is a, I think, I think at the moment, the networks I was playing with were large enough that the drift was negligible. But I expect there to still be like the uh, root T drift that you have. Um, I feel like that that part is probably somewhat unavoidable. Um, the part that falls apart quicker at the moment is more um, if you, for example, have store store surface that has weird kinks in it, and then the uh, then it like I guess you have the equivalent of dephasing where you have a nice blob. You have, you have a nice blob, blob in your state space where your tractor is, and then it just dissolves into a mess. So I think that we do indeed have similar problems, I imagine. I haven't completely solved that, but in, for example, on the sphere, it worked very well. Um, but I imagine on more complex manifolds that that problem still needs to be solved, yeah. Okay, uh, a second question, if I may. Um, you showed Please. that you sort of move north, south, or east, west. Yes. Um, I, I couldn't sort of process the math quickly enough to to answer this question. Can you move like north, south, and east, west, like on a diagonal simultaneously? I yes, um, yes. If you if you impose a uh, a certain amount of each hypervector separately, then um, the gradient terms that get projected out will be akin to yes, move, moving it in that arbitrary direction. So when I wrote when I wrote it out more generally, so I didn't write it out fully generally, I'd say like, here's one where it's in the uh, dx dp1 direction, here's in the dx dp2. But the idea is that at any point, you can decide which of your, what direction your velocity, like your vector should point, that it can be that, what direction your vector which you can trigger should point. So yes, it, that is possible, yeah. So you can apply each of those two different um, sort of movement vector fields with different weights sometimes. Yes, but um, the one problem with it is if you, were to if you were to apply them both at full strength, for example, then because they're both masking operations, you've now reduced the number of neurons in your network functioning to a quarter of it. And so if you apply it too much, uh, then you hit memory blackout and the whole state dissolves. Yeah. That's that's more of a feature than a bug, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll quote you on that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Then I, I saw a hand rising by Marcus. Oh. 
or it was by mistake. I don't know. Maybe I already answered it very well. Mm. I um, I have a question uh, of my own. Uh, so when you say um, uh, you need pretty large network to encode or train uh, the um, sphere surface, so how large is it actually? So, so I think these these were just with uh, I think these were with eight thousand uh, size vectors. Those ones were, um, but. For example, when I try to store a torus instead of a sphere, um, because you then end up with a lot more discrete, you ended up with a lot more states, um, mm -hmm. a lot more distinct states. I couldn't store that in the 8,000 uh, sized uh, neural vector because, well, 8,000 sized weights matrix, I guess, um, because it seems you're storing too many states and the whole thing just collapsed in, collapsed in on itself. Mm -hmm. But these are for the yeah, F8000. But obviously, uh, I mean, just from uh, like quick hot field estimates, that means we should be able to store at least like 800 distinct attractor states. But you hit that quite quickly as, as soon as you, you're, you're talking about like, okay, every distinct state on a torus, for example. Um, and then, uh, sorry if it's a very naive question, but I mean, mm -hmm. in the case of this memory blackout, so when you basically uh, encode more uh, more states than the capacity allows, uh, uh, how does it manifest? So does the network <coughs> generate erroneous states or some rubbish? Uh, I haven't checked exactly what states they go to but for example if we were looking at those 2d plots hmm. um where we have the bump the sink bump that's moving around it would kind of just dissolve into uh, from a bump of size one to a bump of size of mag magnitude half and eventually you end up with just a kind of random soup so it it, yeah. it um, leaves the, it, it leaves the surface and goes somewhere i didn't want it to go okay um, which is sad. Yeah, I, I am thinking more. I mean, uh, by the way, maybe you can also comment so on the application side. So I, I think you 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 have quite strong biological uh, uh, or neuroscience uh, perspective. Uh, I mean, for this work, but I mean, from the application side. So how uh, where this can be useful? <clears throat> All right. Well. Part of this was almost going to be an open call, being if anyone could uh, suggest some concrete places where it could be useful. But mm. um, the things that I'm planning to immediately apply it to would be, for example, um, uh, like maybe simple motor control tasks. Because if you imagine our 2D plane, we could actually swap out for, I don't know, a 3D plane where into a cube of states where one of our dimensions actually is representing time and mm. our phases uh, rotate the sun angular frequency to progress through that. So mm. then you could quite nicely have it such that you uh, have a network that encodes and learns a path in your state mm. space. Yeah. So you say, okay, do this movement, okay, do it again, and then carve out an energy value or something. Yeah. yeah. Or but yeah, I'm sure there's something to do with cognitive maps I can think about, I, sh I should think about, but um, yeah, in, in terms of application driven and not coming from a neuroscience perspective, I'm not, 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 enti not entirely sure. Um, if anyone has any ideas, please hit me up at some but point I, before I finish my I PhD. Make a, a suggestion? Uh, I don't know please. if it's kind of related to my, my second question before. One, not, one possibility is like a cleanup memory. Like when you're doing these sorts of uh, VSA things with these continuous value hypervectors, mm -hmm. um, you would, you know, uh, bind them, unbind them, whatever. You, you know, they start to have noise, and then, then those. Uh, so if your if your um, manifold is if if the Hopfield network does keep the representation on the manifold, you can imagine that if you you got some noise introduced. Um, from unbinding it with something, 
if the dynamics of the hop field network can bring it back on the manifold, that's a type of cleanup memory for uh, mm. these fractional power encoding hypervectors. Mm. So, I, so I guess then would we have to consider the usefulness of say, I guess, I guess, I guess if you had a task where you didn't want to just encode every possible pairing of hypervectors instead, yes, so, some subspace, but yeah, I should think about that. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, thank I'll, you. I'll, I'm, I'm curious, that's something I, I'm also interested in working on. I'll send you an email. Oh, please do. That'd, that'd be very good. Thank you. All right, any more question? questions? Yeah, I had a question um, about the, um, you, you mentioned explicitly that you were not, not doing binding, but masking. And also yes. and you mentioned something about it wouldn't work if you did binding in the asynchronous case. Could you explain yes. again why? So the point is we have an attractor network which is trying at some arbitrary speed to keep bringing, to keep bringing your network state back to some stored state so to keep correcting it. So if you try to apply the operation of um, this neuron multiplied by one, this neuron multiplied by minus one, this one by one, this one by minus one, then if this operation were being applied asynchronously, then let's say um, the first neuron to flip as a result of our had mod operation, as a result of our being multiplied by minus one, well, our network state now just looks like an error version of our stored state. And so it would immediately correct itself. So you would be trying to make the bits flip into to to make your state jump be. You would be trying to make your neurons flip to different states while your neuron vector is actively trying to correct itself and keep it in the same state. Um, I hope that's an explanation, a reasonable explanation. Um, of course, if you could do it completely synchronously and say, right, everyone at the same time flip, then it would work because you could force it so far away from the current attractor state that it stops trying to correct itself. But um, if you're in a completely general asynchronous scenario, then I imagine that wouldn't work, is my argumentation, but. Right, I see. Yeah. So in order to prevent the flipping, you mask the bits that would have caused the flipping and therefore you, you, you maintain. Yeah, so I, 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 I apply a mask to effectively achieve the same result of like, Okay, things that were bound are now no longer bound, but I can apply I could I could apply this operation gradually because it wouldn't be uh, because the network wouldn't start fighting back by trying to like make neurons be alive again or something. I see. And would it then also maybe work if you had a two stage uh, setup where you first asynchronously do the unbinding and then asynchronously do the uh, denoising or the associative memory. I imagine so, but then when I was coming, because right, then it would be yeah, the same as this. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. Um, so yes, if you, certainly if you could disable the uh, the error correction, apply your binding, apply your unbinding by the Hadamard operation, and then let the error correction take over. That then you're in the clear. Um, but it's, I mean, I was I was thinking about it from the perspective of weak biological argumentation. Uh, but also the fact that in our, I, I imagine also even in an asynchronous chip, um, in, in a normal, normal chip, that would probably be quite a pain to try and separate two different stages rather than simply saying, right, I'm going to mask this network. I'm going to mask this network at a leisurely pace. Yeah, no, good, good question. Uh, there was also something related to this that reminded me of uh, something called a tri triarchic memory. I'm trying to find the name exactly. I'm not sure if you've. Well, sounds I, I, this sounds interesting. No. Um, Let me see if I can find the name uh, and then I'll get back to you. Merci beaucoup. Please do. Yeah, in the meantime, so anybody else uh, has a question? Mm. 
No more questions, lovely. I am pretty sure there are questions that just uh, <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> the the subject you presented is not uh, I I would say it's not the usual one for VSA. Oh, so. well, that was good. I was slightly scared someone was going to say, "Oh, yes, I did this 30 years ago." Um, <laughs> so, that's a good sign. But um yeah, I mean in general, if anyone has any further questions or even further ideas of where to take this, um, I would be very, very happy to respond to. Sure, yes. absolutely. Um, so I, my, I found a mask, yeah. by the way. All right, yeah, sure. It's called uh, Triadic Memory by uh, Peter Overman. Um, and basically what it says is that you have a, your starter state and you can provide a, a transition and then goes to your end state. So it's also kind of uh, can implement these transition functions, although it, it doesn't talk about it in that way. It talks oh, cool. about it more in the sense of uh, relationships between entities. In that sense, oh, it's brilliant. to the gods that you're talking about, but it didn't mention it as statement. <laughs> okay, brilliant. I'll, I'll have a look. That sounds precisely the kind of thing I should be uh, yeah. <laughs> mentioning in this talk. Uh, or at least it says that uh, it's based on uh, Pantica Nerva's uh, Spar distributed memory. Oh, lovely. That will be a uh... So, perfect I, I, I see he's not here right now otherwise he would probably know more about it oh, that would be terrifying now, uh, Mike can you um, uh, can you put the link to the chat or yeah no problem I'll put it there it is Merci beaucoup. all right uh, so, last call for questions to uh, Madison. Well, if not, uh, it's getting late, at least in Europe. <laughs> yes. Uh, right. And we are uh, in Sweden, we are still in northern summer when it would be light all the time. So, it's uh, time to wrap up the day. So, thank you very much, Madison, for your great talk. And uh, thank, thank you very you much. All. And thank you all for uh, attending this webinar. So uh, I'll see you in two weeks from now. So if you have any questions or suggestions to medicine, so please uh, write an email to him or and to our mailing list. Um, yes, and uh, stay tuned for the news about Midnight Sun VSA workshop. So thank you all. Sweet. Uh, thank see you. you. See, see you next time. Thanks. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you.